بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بیلنس از اے پروگرام ور وی ٹرائی ٹو برنگ لائف اینڈ فیتھ ان ٹو اے اسٹیٹ آف الائنمنٹ سو دیٹ وی کین ڈسچارج آور ڈیوٹیز بوتھ ٹو آر کریٹر ایز ویل ایز ٹو آر فیلو ہیومن بینگس برنگنگ لائف اینڈ فیتھ ان ٹو ہارمنی ول انیویٹیبلی الاؤ ایز ٹو اچیو اے سینس آف بیلنس بوتھ فزیکلی ایز ویل ایز آن اے اسپریچول لیول enabling us to lead healthier, more fulfilling and rewarding lives. Every week on Balance, we will discuss those challenges that we come across in our daily lives and how we can address these issues in such a manner that is aligned with the teachings of Islam and enables us to achieve spiritually healthy lifestyles. Today's program will focus on parenting strategies and the moral training of children from the newborn to the preschool age. It is said that to be successful at anything, we must start with the end in mind, plan and prepare for it. So when we undertake the moral training of Ahmadi children, we must know the end result that we desire. Our goal is to raise Ahmadi children who will not only be able to fulfill their obligations towards Allah Almighty, but also towards their fellow human beings. Joining me today, Arhira Jamal Sahiba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And Asfa Usman Sahiba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So let me start our discussion today with the tradition of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said that paradise is placed under the feet of mothers. How do Ahmadi mothers earn this paradise? I read once that Hazrat Khalifa al Masih IV, may Allah have mercy on him, stated during an annual convention, and I'm going to paraphrase here, that when it is said that heaven is under the feet of mothers, it does not mean that there is heaven under every mother's feet. It means that if heaven can be attained by latter generations, it can only be attained through mothers who themselves have become a heavenly sign. So this is not something that we attain automatically. It's an elevated status that we as Ahmadi mothers, especially as Ahmadi mothers, have to work extremely hard to achieve. And in order to do so, we must first focus on our own spiritual weaknesses and work on those through prayers and God's help. Absolutely, and you know, it's an ongoing uphill battle. Yes, it is. Um, when you think about Uh, reforming yourself and when you think about all the pressures that are around you and you have to face them you have to you have to fight against yourself mm -hmm. it's the biggest jihad that a woman has to face jihad al akbar and so how do you do that there's only one way to do it and it's to it's to stay connected with allah taala yes. and never let go of the rope that connects you with allah taala mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Awwal, may Allah have mercy on him, said once that his love of the Holy Quran had come to him from his mother because in the period before he was born, he could hear his mother recite the Holy Quran so beautifully and with so much dedication. How does this, what does this tell us about the period before a child is born Um, how does it impact the, the soul and the nature of the newborn? Well, you know, you have to think about, as a mother, what your responsibilities are. As yes. soon as you start expecting, you are already a mother. Yes. You know, you don't have to wait until the child is in your hands to be considered a mother. And so when you recite the Holy Quran, it does give some blessings to your unborn, ch unborn child. You also have to be very mindful about your own physical um, being. So eat properly, eat healthy. It has also been proven by science yes. repeatedly that your intake has a direct effect on your unborn child. Yes, and um, there are actually special prayers that should be recited during this time, such as the prayer of the mother of Hazrat Maryam radiallahu anha, that, O oh my Lord, whatever is in my womb, I give to thee, and the prayer of Hazrat Zakariya alayhi salam, 
um, these prayers should be recited frequently. Mm -hmm. And then Hazur, may Allah be his helper, has said that we should pray for the child to be pious and a true servant of Islam. Mm -hmm. right. And indeed, Hazrat Khalifa to Masih Khamis, may Allah be his helper, has advised us many times that the best thing that parents can do for the training of their children, mm -hmm. the tarbiyat of their children, is to pray for them yes. before they are born. Yes. That's right. Yes. Indeed. Now, most people do think that the preschool age is a little bit too young for children to really learn anything. So why pay attention to this age? And is it even possible that children at this age can learn the love of God and the, learn, uh, uh, the love of their faith so early in life? Absolutely. I, I believe that the fact that society around us keeps uh, emphasizing on the fact that a preschooler is too young to grasp all the information that's around him or her. Um, I mean, they're too young for it. I believe that's not true. Because what you have to understand is that children are sponges. They mimic you, they copy you. Whatever is in their environment, they will grasp it. Um, how do you make sure as a MD Muslim, Muslim woman, mother, that you educate your children from a very young age is that you set yourself as an example. You know, my daughter, alhamdulillah, she knew her whole salat by the age of three. And Mashallah. why? Just because she heard us say it so many times. So it's all in Allah Ta'ala's hands and you have to pray for Allah Ta'ala for him to give those abilities to your children. Yes, and uh, I agree. And a preschooler's brain is still developing. So this is the time to set a child's foundation. Now, keep in mind that we only have four or five years to formulate the thinking of our children before they are exposed to the world. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a very critical time in a child's life where only a mother can have a profound influence on the child and saying that we're burdening our children at this age is not true because kids and preschoolers at this age are very eager to learn and yes. it's easier for them to learn. And it is even said that um, it's easier for a child to learn a foreign language than an adult. Yeah, and absolutely. I believe that it goes beyond the language aspect. Absolutely. That's very true. Indeed, it is a, a very common misconception. Yes. If you take the example of um, television, mm -hmm. you know, most households have a television and families will oftentimes spend, uh, you know, time together watching it. If we make that conscious, simple choice to turn on MTA, right. uh, it will have definitely a positive, blessed impact on our child's mind. Yes. Uh, just listening to those blessed sights and sounds yes. will uh, give them immeasurable uh, knowledge and blessings. Yes. They will be able to recognize the beloved face of Hazur, may Allah mm -hmm. be his helper, yeah. uh, listen to the sounds of the Kalma, yeah. and uh, definitely they will be able to absorb it. Um, and the other uh, thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, of course, kids will be kids and they will also be watching kids programs and other yeah. cartoons. So as mothers, we need to be responsible and educate ourselves about the content of those programs Absolutely. so we can make sure that indeed they are uh, child appropriate. Yes. Absolutely. Child appropriate, yes. And you know, it's our duty to inculcate in them the proper etiquettes. Yes. Um, so when they go outside, they can, they learn from others. Um, some parents will focus on giving them the proper table manners or social mannerism. Now, it's our duty that we make sure that they receive the proper education spiritually and morally. Yes. Now, what I do uh, since my children are really young is that I teach them etiquettes of Salat of the mosque. And so I would tell them, you know, when I'm praying, sit next to me quietly. Don't pass in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so it's my duty to start it from the house unit. And that's when they understand it for it being a norm and they can act then they properly take it outside. outside. And yes. it really does start at home because I know for myself personally, when I take my children to the mosque, I make sure to tell them to clean up after themselves. Mm -hmm. and but we follow that practice at home first, so it comes to the mosque with them. And indeed, it's even more important when you come to the mosque because the mosque is the, the house, house of, of God. God. Exactly, yes. Absolutely. Um, let's hear more about effective parenting strategies. Every child deserves a chance to reach their full potential. The science of child development and of the human brain 
show that the early years of a child's life play a crucial role in shaping the child's personality and success in life. From day one, a baby's brain grows and develops at an amazing rate. A child's brain develops the fastest in the first five years of their life, and these early years have a lasting impact on their future. At birth, a baby's brain is only a quarter of the size of an adult brain. This will double in size during the first year, and reach 80% of adult size by age 3. By the time a child starts kindergarten, their brain is almost fully developed, and is 90% of adult size. As the brain grows in size, it's also forming billions of connections. These connections between neurons, or brain cells, is how the brain works. As the child grows and develops, the brain cells connect to each other in complex ways, thereby forming a network of neurons. Different areas of the brain, responsible for different abilities, all become interconnected. These early brain connections set the stage for higher level skills to develop later on, including motivation, focus, problem solving, and getting along with others. The development of these important skills has a direct impact on a person's ability to learn and to do well in school and in life. The first few years of life are the best opportunity to develop this network of brain connections. It's much harder later on, because building brain connections is like building muscles. Use it or lose it. Connections that are used more often become stronger, while those that aren't are eventually eliminated, thus making the brain more efficient. So how does healthy brain development happen? Through stable, positive, nurturing relationships with parents and caring adults. Neuroscience shows that caring interaction, stimulation and love during the first few years not only help a child feel safe and secure, but also promotes the development of a strong, healthy network of brain connections. On the flip side, it is also evident that stress and persistent negative experiences slow down brain development and allow for fewer brain connections to develop. Research also shows that children who have had positive nurturing experiences in early childhood tend to have better language, math, and social skills. They are more likely to graduate and go on to post-secondary. They are also more prepared for careers and go on to become contributing members of their communities. Therefore, it is vital that we provide our children with positive nurturing experiences that will help them reach their full potential in school and in life. Welcome back. Some women, alhamdulillah, have been able to acquire a university level education or maybe even postgraduate studies, mm -hmm. after which they would perhaps want to pursue a career or they wish to work for a few years. Um, if they have a family as well and they have children, how do they make that choice? Where do they keep that balance? Hazur, may Allah be his helper, has actually been asked this question and he has always said that the main responsibility of a woman is towards her children. And he also said that he met some doctors in the U.S. who told him that they took years off their careers to focus on their children while they were young and then they went back to work or went back to school once their children were older. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, Islam is a beautiful religion. It gives yes. you the freedom that you need, mm -hmm. uh, the guidance that you need to have to, to educate your children in the best manner. And Hazur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asal Aziz also said that going and getting education should be for your children's sake first. Yes. And so, you know, sometimes the focus can be on um, building up your profession or, you know, going outside after you graduate and working. But that's where we have to understand that our responsibility first is to our children. Yes. Indeed. Yes. MashaAllah, I know both of your children 
are in the Blessed Waqf and All scheme. Yes, yes. How do you understand this responsibility and what steps do you take to ensure that your children are ready to be servants of Islam Ahmadiyyat? Um, well, this responsibility of raising two Waqfino children is the most important responsibility that I have. And what we have to understand, generally speaking, is that it's parents' decision to dedicate their unborn child for the service of Islam Ahmadiyyat. Yes. And so naturally, it's our duty to make sure that we fulfill um, whatever is required of us to give them the best um, tarbiyat. Uh, best education and upbringing for that. And how do you do that? Uh, it, it's really it's really amazing to notice and to, to understand that we have Khilafat with us. Yes. Khilafat guides us. The Khalifa is around, you know, comes in our houses every week. There is one Friday sermon in particular that is very special for Vakfino children. It's the one for, um, from October 28, 2016. Invaluable advice has been given in it. Yes. And so what do I do to make sure that my children stay connected with the scheme of Vakfino and that they know who they are? is that I bring them to all the meetings, be it Nasrat, Atfal, or Vakfino. We make sure to write regularly to, to Hazur. Even if my children cannot write, um, you know, they draw something and they send it. They know in their hearts it's for their Hazur, their best friend. Mm -hmm. And that's this connection that's really important for children to build from that young age. Yeah, and it's a, it's a huge responsibility to have Vakfino children. Um, at, my daughters are one and four, and at this young age, they don't fully comprehend what it means to be a wakfeno child. But we follow small practices at home to get them to that understanding, um, such as we continuously tell them that they're wakfeno children and that they're special. Um, we have them try to build a bond with Khilafat by talking to them about Hazur and by having them watch MTA regularly. Yes. And I pray that God gives me the strength to raise them well, raise good children, and I have them pray for themselves even. And inshallah, by building on these foundations, we can raise good Waqfino children. Inshallah. inshallah. So what are some resources or some places that new mothers can turn to to learn more about the Islamic guidelines on raising children? So there's a chapter in the book, um, The Way of Seekers, that I personally referred to before my children were born. Um, it's called The Moral Training, Training of, of a Child. child. And um, in it, there there's a lot of um, gems and guidances to be gained. And I think that every mother should read that before before their child, children are born. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. There's another book um, from Hazrat Majan, the wife of the Promised Messiah, Salam. Mm -hmm. Hazrat Majan, her, it's, in it's titled Sirat Hazrat Majan. And so this is a really, really good book for all the mothers to read and mm -hmm. get invaluable advice and guidance from. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we have Hazrat Khalifa al Masih Khamis, may Allah be his helper. Mm -hmm who does guide us at every step and who prays so much for us and our children, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Um, Jazakallah for all of your valuable advice and insights. We're almost at the end of our program today. Any last thoughts? Um, raising children is not an easy task. It's extremely hard and everyone, every parent has a different style of parenting. But we all have one thing in common, and that is the guidance from Islam and Ahmadiyyat on how to raise pious children. And I believe that if we stay true to those guidelines and follow the teachings of Islam and Ahmadiyyat, then inshallah, we as mothers can gain paradise under our feet. Yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And you know, like, um, like she just said, raising children is one of the hardest jobs that a, a woman can have. And uh, it's one of our biggest jihad. And what I would say to other mothers or other women living in the 21st century is one of our duty is to make sure that all the noise around us, all the influences of the society are, are shunned. Um, you know, you have to make sure that you do your best to mute them when your children get home. Give them the best um, environment they are attracted to. And 
there's, a, you know, you have to understand and pray that you're able to fill in the gap that's between children going outside, hearing things, mm -hmm. seeing things, and the education, spiritual education you're trying to give them. So I pray for myself, Ella, please give me the ability to influence them in the best manner. The influence is very key. Yes, definitely. I'm going to end today's program with an excerpt from the writings of the Promised Messiah, salam. He says, I pray for my children and require them to follow a broad set of rules of behavior and no more. Beyond this, I put my full trust in Allah Almighty with the confidence that the seed of good fortune inherent in each one of them will flourish at its proper time. Jazakum Allah ta'ala wa asana al-jaza. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.